first of all, thank you so much for coming back. Oh my goodness. Thanks for having me back. And thanks everyone for being here. I'm just looking at your gorgeous faces and it's so fun to be able to see you. Yay. Yeah. Kathy, thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. I think I told you this, but that day that I saw you in San Francisco, you were at O university. Mm. And, um, then when I had you on my podcast, my phone likes to shoot out, you know, photos of this day, a year ago, this day, five, and it was, it's as I went to interview you and I was all like intimidated and scared and excited and all the, all those feelings, I got a photo and it was like, this is where you were this day, 10 years ago. And it was me just having walked out of listening to you speak. And wow. I was like, you see how the universe is just so good. It's like with it GPS. Really was. It just, isn't that fascinating in the way that the tapestry threads of our lives are woven through the tapestry and you don't see someone for a few years and then ooh, here they come to the surface of the tapestry again and yeah we're all one big pattern together it's exciting it's so <laughs> exciting so and your work is just you you've just given all of us like Hansel and Gretel with the those breadcrumbs like helping people find their way home I feel like every day of your life you're just like, here, let me help you find your way home. So oh, they, I thought they, you were going to say, I'm fattening people up to eat them. And yes. I'm like, oh, happy. I don't do that anymore. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I never did that, guys, seriously. Um, so the last time you were here, we talked a little bit about your book, The Way of Integrity, which was about to come out. Now it's been out for a little while, but it's been sort of like, people love this book. There's a woman named Oprah who loves this book. She's been singing its praises very yeah. recently again and again. Um, let's just talk about this book and then we'll, we'll go into some other stuff because we talked about it last time, but it's so good. Oh, thank you. Why did you feel the need to write a book called The Way of Integrity after you've written so many other beautiful books? What was it about integrity that you felt like you had to sort of share? You know, I thought I was done with nonfiction. I was, I'd written a novel all off by myself, published it myself. I was going to write some more. And then I started doing this thing called integrity cleansing, which I've done my whole life. But with the amount of stuff that's been going on in our world lately, I mean, look at what, what is happening right now with you. Oh, Beyond. Um, yeah, it, it, it's very unsettling right now. And um, I, when I was a sociologist, I studied change. And what I could see was that change was accelerating and getting more impactful in people's lives. Now, this was before the pandemic, but I thought to keep myself grounded, I have to do something to stay exactly inside my own truth, because there are so many forces coming at us these days that it can knock you off your center, right? Yeah. And our center is our truth. So I've been doing this thing that I call integrity cleansing for 30 years. And it's just where you decide you're not going to tell any lies or do anything that feels false to you for a certain amount of time. And I, the first time I did it was a year. This time it's been seven years. So seven years ago, I started a big integrity cleanse. And as I did it, just to be clear and honest, all these wonderful, miraculous things started happening in my life. And I realized integrity is the basis of all our happiness it's the basis of our of i'm just going to say the word magic it's the basis of our relationships and our whatever we do for a career in these crazy times and i realized i had more than an article's worth of material so i i, I thought this is changing my life completely i really have to share this this is like the final self-help thing i have to say so i put it all in that book and then handed it in the day Manhattan locked down with, with the COVID pandemic the first time. Everybody was like scared to death. Wow. And it, yeah, it seemed to kind of turn into being a book for our times. And that was just because the force had the puppet strings, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting, so interesting to me is that my whole life, I thought of integrity sort of as having good character, okay? Right. And then when you described it the first time you were here to talk about it, and, and now when you're saying it again, the way that I hear it, and even in reading your book, it's so obvious that you, you're you referring to what I, what I call like being authentic. And yeah. the fact is that it's so unbelievable. It's like an atom bomb going off when I realize that being in integrity means being authentic. Yeah. Because my whole life, I actually felt that I had to be a yeser and a pleaser 
yeah. and that that was actually having not necessarily that I think it was integrity, but I, I thought maybe it kind of was actually. Well, no, people tell you that's how to be in integrity, make everybody happy. But integrity, the literal word just means intact, one thing whole and undivided. I almost called the book undivided. But um, what happens is that we're all born that way in integrity. And then we try to please others or cope with an environment that's not always right for our true nature. Mm -hmm. And so our true nature we're splits off and we abandon it either to please other people or to cope with trauma or whatever it is. And we come, become split from our true selves and that's duplicity. And like an airplane that when it loses its structural integrity, it can't work. When we split ourselves and we're no longer whole, we feel lost, we feel broken and nothing works. So coming back into integrity is just finding ourselves again and becoming that one person we were always meant to be. Guys, is this blowing your mind? Can you tell, tell me in the chat, you're saying you're feeling this. I really, truly, like, I want to go deeper into this because I think that part of being a pleaser is that we think on some level when we're codependent that we're doing it to be kind to the other person. Yeah. Meaning, you know, if, if, we, we, if we were to not belong to this person the way they want us to be, whether it's our religion, whether it's the way that we spend money, whether it's who we voted for, whether it's how we're eating, whatever it is that we're dancing with, with this other person. Can you shed a little light on how it actually might be unkind to them? Mm -hmm. Is there anything at all that we might be doing actually that's not kind to the other person by co-signing in, in the dance, by continuing to stay in the dance? Yeah. Well, for one thing, they're never encountering our real selves. So they're never going to feel sure that they've really connected with anyone because we're coming from a false self and they can feel that they don't really know what it is, but they can feel it. But the other thing is that it's, you know, have you ever been anybody on the screen? Have you been in that situation where you're in a love relationship, a romance and one person wants out, but doesn't say so because they want to be kind to the other person? Yeah. And then they finally, it ends in a big blow up. And the person says, I never loved you. I, for the last 10 years, I've just been enduring, trying to be nice to you. And of course, the other person is completely devastated. So it's actually worse than if you're honest with them. Another thing is that people don't treat themselves the way we treat them. They treat themselves the way we treat ourselves. So if you're talking about children, when one of my kids was little, a friend of mine was sitting on our, our rug and the baby ran past and tripped on my friend's foot and fell down and started crying. And my friend took her own foot and started hitting it and said that bad foot, bad foot, you shouldn't trip babies. And Lizzie, my little kid, she, she looked at her and then she took her own foot and she started pounding oh. and saying bad, bad, bad. So when you are thinking that your true self has to be pushed aside because there's something fundamentally wrong with it. What the other person ends up reflecting inside their own energy is the feeling that something's wrong with them. And it's a very subtle, as I said, it's energetic, but there's so much, it's so tangible, the energy that we communicate one to another. And because it's not verbal, we don't think it's real, but we feel it all the time. So when you're in integrity, people feel safe with you. They know that the person mm. in front of them is the whole person, the real person, and nothing but that person. And that puts everyone at ease. It's so powerful because this is like, it's like you just turned the lights on. You know, it's like we're all living in this way all the time. It's so exhausting. And yeah. this really is such a truth. It really does feel good when you feel that what's coming and and you're right the energy is so tangible you said something that um the first time i ever saw you speak live i was referring to before and you were talking about when you were in that beautiful powerful season of your life when you were pregnant hmm. and you asked your, you said i had already answered the question did i want to have a baby and then you said now i was asking like what kind of baby or like is worth having, which is not a question I thought I would ever ask. And then it came around to this, like, would this baby experience joy, which is like one of the most beautiful, this is what like the tears just came. Talk about being an in integrity. Um, I was just so moved, like as so many people around the world have been moved by that story. But why I'm bringing this up is because I feel like that is such a novel thing for someone to say, 
this this huge radical permission slip of so so live in joy and you've written books on this and and this is the thing that we often give up right when we're out of integrity it's like who am i to just choose what feels good and i wanted you to share and talk about that because you are such a you've been it's like a siren bringing the boats home like this is one of the big <laughs> things that you've put into the world is the permission slip for people to allow themselves to yeah. to chart the course from a place of joy. And that really is a muscle. I think a lot of times we're desensitized to, but it puts us back in integrity, I think. So can yeah. you talk about how, how, how we can do that and how we can give ourselves permission to do that? Yeah. Thank you. So anyway, um, there I was 25 years old, pregnant with my second child. For those of you who don't know what she's talking about, um, he was prenatally diagnosed. I was about five and a half months pregnant and had already watched him sucking his finger on an ultrasound screen and so forth. And, and then I found out he had Down syndrome and I had to make a choice very quickly whether or not to terminate the pregnancy. And there weren't a lot of people who had made that choice at the time, it was very unusual. Um, in fact, the doctors told me that they'd never had a case where someone got this kind of news and did not terminate the pregnancy. And um, they said it was just because I was too young to know any better. Um, maybe. <laughs> But I remember thinking, just as Kathy said, like, this is a judgment on the child one way or another. And by the way, if you've made the opposite decision, I 100% support you. Every situation is different. But I started to think, you know, what is my life about? Why did, why was I allowed to be born? What, what is this child's life going to be about? And I was at Harvard at the time getting a doctorate. And I walked around and looked at the people in their offices, their very prestigious offices. And I thought, none of them looks happy. Like, what do I want? Do I want one of those offices for this child? Or do I want, what do I want? And the answer that came back was joy. Emerson said, beauty is its own excuse for being. And I thought joy is the feeling of beauty as, as the soul lives it. And joy is its own excuse for being. So if this child can feel joy, I'm already in love with him. I'm going to keep him. And he came out and proceeded to not be like we're supposed to be. He's got Down syndrome. He doesn't do the things that we're supposed to do to be like reputable, powerful, wealthy, whatever. He doesn't fit any cultural norms, but he is a model of honesty, integrity, joy. And I just learned from his energy that if you do that, if you completely focus your life on what feels true to you, and he just says, if he doesn't want to say something like his friend Joey calls and really needs to talk, if he doesn't feel like he's like, mm, no, we're like, but Joey needs to talk. Mm, maybe, maybe later, not so much now. And it just doesn't bother him. He does what's right for him. But what that means is that his friendships are real and solid. There's no pretense. There's no resentment. It means that his whole life, there's no pretense, no resentment. And so I've tried to follow that. And then other people said, whoa, what are you doing? It looks kind of interesting. And I started teaching them and then coaching them. And my whole life philosophy came out of this one, exactly what you said, Kathy, this one realization that the only reason I can think of for this existence in human form, which is bound to, die, uh, to end, is that while we're here, we experience things that are beautiful and joyful. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And it's hard not to get emotional because when I think when you hear things that are true so true it's just sometimes the body's response is to cry and um I think about like my husband actually has a sister who has down syndrome and, and everybody has heard me share like what a good person my husband is and this is his older sibling and it made him the kind of person that is so compassionate it's unbelievable and um so grateful and um, it's given me so much peace in my life because he, his experience of life is like every moment is a gift and people don't have to be spectacular to be lovable. And it's just like the levels of what he got growing up in that con constellation. Yeah, It's, um, it's amazing. And wow. that's the gift that, that Adam has given every time he walks through the world, you know, he just turn it's like a magic wand it's like fairy dust he gives that to everybody wherever he goes 
Yeah, they told me that he would ruin my, I had another daughter at the time and they told me he would ruin her life. Then I had a second child. So third child, second daughter, Adam was in the middle. And I tried never to make them take care of him or like I tried to protect them from his Down syndrome because the doctors told me that he would ruin their lives. And then he started, they started liking movies that were sort of tween age movies and he still <laughs> liked Disney movies like cartoons for a while, not anymore. But I, I told the, my girls, you don't have to go to the movies with Adam, but they would go to the movies and sit on either side of him. And instead of watching the cartoon, they would watch him because the experience of watching him enjoy something is so radiant and so pure that they were just drinking from this sort of fountain of sweetness that he is. But each of us is that. It's not because he has Down syndrome. It's because he's in integrity. He is what he is. And anyone who gets to that place where they're whole and undivided becomes that fountain of sweetness. You And you just, everybody in this moment right now, sharing this consciousness, right? And we just all feel lifted so immediately. Um, I wanna ask you this because you wrote a book about joy, which everybody should get if you don't already have it. It's from a while ago, it's so good. And we're talking about it now. And what's so fascinating, I heard Esther Hicks, you know, she's always talking about feeling good. And it's like, all you need to be doing. <laughs> and I was listening to her say, you know, like one of the things she always says, and it dawned on me that like, it's so fascinating. The cost of getting what people want is to feel good and they're not willing to do it. I know. Isn't that interesting? WTF. Like, can you explain how feeling good really is like, like, like you said, like what Emerson said, like its own excuse for being, and then how that actually is like a path to everything. And then why on earth okay. are we unwilling to just feel good if that's what gets, what is that? What is that resistance to having joy? I'll tell you, I think joy is our nature. And in linguistic terms, the opposite of nature is culture. So we can't, culture means any pressure put on us by other people. So we're born um, with, uh, pure joy intact, but then we're also born very, very sensitive to whether or not we're being accepted by the people around us. And because we're so dependent for so long, that survival instinct in us says, please, the people around you, you must please them or they won't take care of you and you will die. Like as a baby, you've got, you're not like a baby horse, you've got no options. So we grow up very, very influenced by our culture. And when we start to find that that culture is toxic to our true nature, we have to make a choice over and over again. Do we keep abandoning our nature to go to culture or do we stay with our nature and let the culture do to us what it wants? <laughs> and I can tell you, I had probably the rockiest year that any of you is likely to have when you go on an integrity cleanse. The year I was 29, I decided not to tell a single lie for a year. And that not only meant speaking lies, it meant not doing things that felt dishonest. That like I was pretending to like something that I didn't like. Well, that <laughs> year, I, now to start with, I was in incredible suffering. I'd been suffering chronic pain for 12 years. I was very depressed, never remembered not being depressed, um, really struggling. And so I thought, all right, they say the truth will set you free. Here we go. That year, I either walked away from or lost my, religion of origin. I was born into a very religious community. So I left the religion. There went my family of origin, all the friends I'd ever had as a child and a teenager. Uh, a lot of relationships went. Then I realized I hated my job, which was being a professor. It was the only thing I was trained for, but I left. So I left academia, decided I was going to write for a living. Oh, that's easy. That's just 10 years work for like $20,000. It'll be great. Um, I left my home because I, I'd moved back to Utah. I was raised Mormon after Adam was born so that I wouldn't get so much flack from people about the decision with him. And so I lost pretty much everything. Oh yeah. Realized I was gay. Oh yeah. That, um, so there went my marriage, but also my gender identity, like everything went onto the fire that year. And my God. That's why we don't follow joy because it wasn't easy. It was, it was a trial by fire and it was 
enormously painful. And the diseases that I had been diagnosed with all went away, even though they were supposed to be incurable. Wow. My depression went away, even though I was grieving like crazy for the loss of all my primary relationships. Um, my sense of hopelessness went away, even though I had no job prospects. Like everything good happened inside, but on the outside, holy smokes, which is why I re recommend you do not do that. You take it in tiny little steps, right? You can handle a disagreement with your mother. That's okay. You don't need to leave your religion and be cursed to hell for everybody, by everybody you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to do it, it clears your sinuses and shows <laughs> you why we would rather accommodate and abandon ourselves than be seen as abandoning everyone around us. Oh my God. It's like listening. It's like a Herculean amount of strength because most people they'll spend their entire life, right? This is what Bronnie Ware said when she was here. You know, the greatest regret of the dying is people say I didn't live life on my terms. So think of how the majority of people and Daniel Pink was just here saying, corroborating the same information in his book and regrets, which means that most people probably would spend their entire life, not even allowing themselves to notice one of those nine things. And in a year you were like, whack-a-mole it was like nope 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 yep. and that's the game <laughs> like we're out of here I, I, true it, it was herculean if hercules spent his life like huddled in a corner of his bedroom crying <laughs> so i did a lot of that but there was this feeling of i must be free i must be free one of the great spiritual traditions of asia says you can always recognize uh, the ocean when you encounter it, because it will always taste of salt, no matter what it looks like. And you can always know your own enlightenment, no matter what it looks like. It could look very strange, but you'll know it because enlightenment always tastes of freedom. And that's what it said. The truth will set you free. It doesn't say the truth will make everybody like you forever and ha you'll have no problems. Right. Yeah. And uh, they say the truth will set you free, but first it will have its way with you. <laughs> And oh my God. And people I'm are just joking. It's great. <laughs> well, that's what I was just going to say. Everybody loves your humor um, in the chat. And I think it's, that's very, it's unique and rare that someone can be so brilliant, so vulnerable and so funny all in the same person, um, which is because you're clearly living a life that is alive and there's a lot of joy there. And so you can be silly about things that are also really painful at the same time there's room for both. So you just said like the key thing, which is there's a part of us that's so scared. And then you circled back to like, it won't mean that everybody will like you. So I feel like so much of what comes up when people ask me a question, it's, it just comes down to the courage to risk being liked. Like yeah. this is like in everything. It's like, I'm afraid to post this thing, start this business. What do I say? It's like, is this really just about you know, and you, we talked about this once where, where people say you, you were sharing that people will be like, well, everyone will say, and you said, everyone, let's talk about that for a minute. What does that really mean? And how can we find out that it's not everyone? Yeah. Most of us have about three people in our heads and they're shouting at us from the inside of our brains. And some of them are dead and some of them don't even <laughs> care, <laughs> but we hear them all the time. And we think, oh, my behavior has to be constrained by what that person thinks of me. And um, here's the thing. They're not even thinking it about you. If you abandon your integrity to become someone false that they will love, that's not you. They are approving of something that is a ghost self, a projection. And when you become your true self and become the little boy in the parade saying that the emperor has no clothes and everybody's like, oh, how very dare you. Um, a lot of people will scatter, but the ones who come back, the ones who come in, the ones who stay close, they are connected to your true, authentic, whole self, all of you, yourself, your true self, and nothing but yourself. And that means that those relationships, it's like your relationship with your dog. It's very pure. It's not complicated. Right. Everybody gets to be who they are. So there's none of the jockeying and, and posturing. And oh my gosh, by, by comparison, most relationships just look horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, my friend Susie says to me, like, it's really not a problem that people think whatever they think. It's a problem that we think they're not supposed to because everyone's living in their own projection. It's like their own hologram. And another thing, I, there's like six things that you say that I quote, and I quote you on them all the time, which is 
people talk about this thing about imposter syndrome. And I remember asking you, what do you think about that? And how on earth did you like walk into that first session with Oprah and be like, of course, I'm going to like coach this woman who's like queen of the world. And you shared, you shared how you were able to do that. And I, I just want you to share that now because I think it's really helpful because we put so much on who am I to do this and what will they think? And, and that is, that does seem ridiculous. <laughs> like for someone to be her coach seems. Yeah. And I'm not really the coach coach. I mean, she very kindly listens to me, but I would never presume to say, I'm going to make, I'm going to make your life work Oprah Winfrey. No, but she does listen to me, which is incredible. <laughs> frankly, Kathy, whatever I said to you in response to that, I don't remember it, but I will tell you what I think. And that is that imposter syndrome happens. This may be what I said. Imposter syndrome happens because we're so busy splitting from ourselves to become adequate, like get this degree, get that experience, get this accolade, um, you know, get this title. And we think if we get enough stuff from the culture around us, we'll feel like we belong in a position of authority or whatever, and we won't feel like imposters. But the reason you feel like an imposter is that you are posing in life as someone not yourself. So when I was like racking up the Harvard degrees and you know wearing the professor clothes and everything, I felt imposter syndrome because that wasn't me. So I'd stand in front of a group of students and think, I'm an imposter, what am I do doing teaching these people? But it was because the real me wasn't standing up in front of them. And when I started doing that, and just being really, really honest with my students. That's when I actually became a coach because they started hiring me outside of class. And, and the whole idea, and the, the imposter syndrome went away because the impostering had always been pretending that the false me could help people be happier. The real me is connected to the divine. So it's not, I don't even exist. And it's just an opening where the divine can do its work. And that's where I don't feel like an imposter when myself disappears and that, and there's just being, yeah. that's what we're all looking for. I think it's so beautiful. And that last piece is exactly what you said, which is, it's just so powerful, right? It's like, you can just move aside and there you are then a portal. And then that goes back to what you said about when a person is in integrity, people feel safe being around you like that. It, that then becomes that becomes you standing for total abundance and infinite truth is that you you're you're allowing yourself to to exist there in integrity you're allowing which then means that everyone's okay to be wherever they are right, right. and 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 as a as a result they can bounce off of that residence and come back to their own self and their own truth and it's like then you've already said everything without saying anything at all yeah, the sense of truth is something that I write about. And everything we know, we know through our sense of truth. And when you've lost your sense of truth by splitting away from yourself, you feel unsafe all the time and no one feels safe around you. But when you've got your sense of truth and you're living by it, everyone sort of feels it. They can kind of lean into it. They sense the groundedness and everyone has a true self, a true nature that is yearning for and striving for connection with that oneness. Mm. And that's the other thing is that when you come into complete integrity with your own parts, the different parts of yourself and your life, you find that the, the boundaries of self don't stop with your body. It, you start to feel the, the connection between different things that it's all one big thing, whole and undivided that you and the rest of the human race are one thing, whole and undivided. And, and your connection with animals, with plants, with the universe as a whole, you start to experience that as absolutely tangibly real. It's not a set of concepts that I'm telling you. It's what you feel as you become your true nature. And then what you think of as self, this little body, it just goes, whoo, and it, it's just everything. And that, it's so ironic because there's this false self, get rid of the false self, become true self, and then whoo, no self. It's just like they say in Asia. <laughs> it's so good. And uh, I, we, those, some of the people who are on the screen are in this program called Abundant Ever After. And we just talked about mm -hmm. this meditation yesterday. Nobody, no time, nowhere. Like when you were born, this life force, nobody, it's nobody, you're nobody. And it's like such a gift. And 
Deepak will be on the podcast tomorrow. We just recorded this episode and he was like, that's the secret to the universe is knowing who you really are, which is no one. (laughs) You're just part of this oneself and it's so liberating. And in that place, you're right. There's no need to be an imposter. There's no need to try to be more of something because you're everything and then you can connect. So let's talk a little bit for one more moment. Let's talk a little bit about joy and practicing joy. You you give so many beautiful ideas of how we can live this way as a diet um, in your book, The Joy Diet. And um, how does that then help the whole one, the giant oneself, us being in joy? What are some things we can do and how does it affect everybody else? Well, first of all, the experience of wholeness is an experience of joy and, and a joy that is not an emotion. There's a peace. The, the one thing that rings people's chime of truth more than any other single thing I've ever found is the sentence, I am meant to live in peace. So if everybody here can just repeat that in your mind a couple of times, I am meant to live in peace. I am meant to live in peace. And if you keep saying it, I'm meant to live in peace. I'm meant to live in peace. The, I, the fact is, this is about as close to an absolute truth as anything I've ever found all over the world. Everybody I've ever talked to, that makes them feel themselves come into alignment. Once you're in a state of peace, it looks very boring to the mind or to the television or whatever. But that peace starts to expand into an intensity of joy that is impossible to describe it's like a flavor that is so delicate that at first your your tongue can't even pick it up but then when you start to really taste it it's like oh my god this is this is the most delicious thing i have ever ever tasted so as that expands there's a joy that permeates life even in the midst of grief sorrow trauma loss and that's what i found out when i was 29 and ever after that the experience of becoming true to yourself is it puts you on this path of joy like a bloodhound on a scent. And one way I like people to work with it is just write a list of the things you have to do today and then look up, look down the list and see how, what you feel in your body and your heart and your soul when you look, okay, I'm gonna go to the dentist. Hmm, okay, fine. I'm going to walk my dogs. Oh, there's a sense of, oh, lift. And then there's, I'm going to call Sally to tell her something. And oh, well, all you have to do is move your list of things to do a little bit in the direction of what makes you happier. I call it one degree turns in in the book. Um, If you're flying an airplane 10,000 miles and every half hour, you just turn it one degree north, you'll end up in a totally different place and you won't even know you've turned. So this is a way to go on an integrity cleanse without killing yourself or doing what I did. You just gently nudge your life toward what brings you that specific kind of joyful peace that you feel when you're completely quiet inside. And that will transform everything you do, everyone you hang out with, your career, everything. Oh, you guys, isn't this so good? It's so good. And it, yeah, I feel like we all need this. We've always needed it, but especially going through the pandemic and especially when you're watching this horror show, it's like literally watching a nightmare come alive right now, uh, you know, in the Ukraine. And you're like, what can I do? And you feel so helpless and you give some money and you like try to donate clothes to some refuge and you're like, what can I do? And this really feels like something that now has to happen. Like we all have to be more in integrity because it's just time's up on all the little ways in which that affects the world when we're not, it's just can't happen anymore. And I grew up obsessed with like ecology and uh, human suffering all over. And this is why I was so depressed all the time. Right. Being a teenager. <laughs> right. And I remember thinking, and I was, I was kind of a liberal thinker in the most conservative place in the world. And I was, I, it was just, it was rough. And then, and I thought, what can I do to change the world? And I felt this need And actually, I kind of want, by show of hands, how many people watching here have felt at some point that you were meant to be part of a profound shift in the way humans live on earth? Some yes, some no. An increasing number of people feel this way, I think. And for me, it was like a fever. I could not stop Mm -hmm. obsessing about it. And I thought, how do I change the world? How do I change the world? Yeah, I'm weak and small. And then I thought, okay, maybe I'll go to academia and I'll do research and I'll change. That felt weak and small. 
And then I decided, then I did this year of truth and I realized the power of one being in integrity is kind of like those bombs we're so afraid of. Like there's so much power. And I think that two forces are rising in synchrony on the earth right now. One is the forces of division and, uh, and splitting people and rage and all the things. I write about this much more in the book. And it's very loud. It makes a lot of noise. It explodes things. It gives fiery speeches and beats its chest and all of that. And on the other side is an increase in integrity that people are resorting to because we feel the urgent need to get yes. our feet on the ground. And that force is silent. So what we see is ah! all over the world and it's terrifying. But what we don't see unless we drop in is like it's a duality and as the as the violence rises so mm -hmm. is peace rising and it's at an unprecedented level and um it relies on each of us finding our integrity and then whatever we're meant to do comes through the no self with enormous power so thank you kathy i know you're in the same boat i am you feel the same way oh yeah always always wanted to do that and uh it's visceral you know and that was what happened that day i saw you speak and i walked outside and i just bawled my eyes out and I turned to God and I was like, you have to just throw me a compass. Like, how am I supposed to do this? Like, I know I'm supposed to use my hands and my voice like every day, all day long, just to serve. And what do I do? And, and, and it answers, you know, it's, it's just, there's a whisper, you follow it. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it, it's not like, you know, Susan do this. <laughs> that God will always say the same thing. Okay. Kathy, what makes you happy? And it's a happiness you have to, it's what you yearn for. And it says, go toward that. That yearning is your compass and you ne it will never leave you. Yeah. And you I know it, I have. know it sounds crazy to say it, but I don't mean it in a silly way. I mean, it in a serious way, like I look at these dictators in the world and I think like if they had, if we, if there was a way to get them safe, like with no arms and in a room to have this experience, they could find out that they don't need power to feel better, to feel right. It's like they just somewhere along the way got really caught in the story of this ego and everything is this illusion of separation and they need more in order to be more and they need significance and they find it this way. And it's like, you are so significant. <laughs> you are so much more than enough. If you could just find that out. That's all I see when yeah. I see this stuff. And it's a portrait of every one of our own egos. Like, where is the dictator in you that says, I want more and I want more attention and people should be nicer to me. You know, like find the dictator in yourself and nourish her, love her, calm her. Oh, yeah, I see mostly female faces on the screen. Uh, nourish yourself, love yourself, comfort yourself and take yourself back into peace. And the dictator inside you becomes part of the forces for good. And that's, that's the only way we have of changing anyone, I think. Yeah, totally. And I want to use this as a segue to talk about this other thing, because so often when we do get triggered by people, right, like, obviously, it's, it's very easy to get triggered by things in the news. But then there are times you get triggered by like a friend of yours or someone in your family or right it happens all the time. And I was just saying to a friend of mine this morning, I always look at that like such a gift of an opportunity because I'm only bouncing off against my own hologram. So I'm like, ooh, where's the breakthrough here? And you just did that by saying, even for that, it's like, careful, like, yeah, you, you can definitely support the Ukraine or whoever you're, whatever it is. But if you're really, really triggered, like take a second, look at yourself. And that's happening all the time in our own neighborhoods with our own family, with our own spouse, like whatever. How can we understand that that's the edges of our own projection hologram? And how can we find our way to whatever the gift of that contrast is that's wanting to just be released yeah you know it's not subtle the, the thing is what makes you feel good and what, what makes you feel bad is pretty evident to you maybe you're sort of in a middle zone but when something really bothers you you know it and when something really thrills you and brings you joy you know it suffering is our best ally on this whole expedition because if it's present it's telling us you're not headed in the way you should find the way out how do you find the way out you look it's in your blind spot. You don't know where to find the things that would make you better. If you did, you would make them better. Right. The way it shows up is that people make you pissed off. Yeah. 
<laughs> there are people who are just, they just either you're so in anguish over their pain or you just can't stand them or whatever it is. Whenever you have a strong negative sensation toward another person, sit down, write a letter to them. Dear so-and-so, I, I, this is in the book, this exercise. And I started it when I was working with two people as clients and one of them just drove me nuts. And I thought, I got to get this out of myself. So I sat down and I wrote to her, you know, here's what I really, truly think of you. Here's what you should do. You should try being more honest for a change. You should stop lusting after the, you know, various titles and honors. You should, you should, you should, you should. And then I, I finished writing and then I went up and I crossed out her name and I put my own name in and I reread it. And I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. And that, and I was like, I've got to, this woman is showing me what I've got to heal in myself. And when I did, by the way, she disappeared. Like she, she had been kind of stalking me and it, she just vanished. <laughs> and then I felt so bad. I thought maybe I'm just a bad person. So I sat down and I wrote a letter to someone I greatly admired. It was Mary Oliver, the poet. Yeah. And I wrote down things to her, you know, thank you for going into nature every day. Thank you for the, the spirit you brought into the natural world and all these things. Thank you for going out on long walks and not paying any attention to what people thought of you. Um, and then I crossed out my own hurt name and put my own. And I realized I thought I was cheating. I thought I was taking little breaks when I'd go out for walks, but my soul was telling me, be like Mel Mary Oliver, do more of that and do less of what this irritating person is doing. So we're always being given these wonderful teachers who come to us as strong negative or positive influences and they always reflect what we need to learn next. Oh, Martha Beck, it's so good. That was like unbelievable. Okay, that's yet another thing I'm gonna be quoting you. That whole piece was just so gorgeous. Um, yeah, it's like listening to Byron Katie, all your problems disappear. You know, it's like, you just exit out, put yourself in there. Like, there you go. Right. It's just exactly. such a gift. It's all such a gift. Okay. I want to mention before we take some questions and you can put your questions in the chat, um, that Martha's going to have a six week course, which is like perfect timing. Cause it starts in May after this is sort of winding down. Um, let's just talk a little bit about wild new ways and mm -hmm. what, what's the sort of transformation of this program. Let's dive into it for a second. Well, you talk about compasses, the, the basic strategies in this um, program I came up with when I was writing a book called Finding Your Way in a Wild New World. And I was, uh, I had the opportunity to interact with a lot of people from indigenous cultures in different places. And I'd started, I had a very weird run-in with an Amer uh, not, not a run-in, beautiful encounter with an African Sangoma or shaman. And she told me, she she came to see me because I'd had a certain dream who knew and she said look you've got to learn the wisdom of the ancient people and and get it to the people of your culture and I was like all right so I went out for like five years I went looking for what is the magic of other cultures and I don't believe in magic I just think there's a lot of science we don't understand yeah and I, I started to see all oh, these people um, are following a set of compasses and doing a set of practices that we never do in our culture because we don't have medicine people. We don't have shamans. We have doctors and physicians and ecologists, but in, in, in ancient cultures, they're all one thing, right? So what I saw was that they were using something I called the technologies of magic. And it's like in these bodies of ours, we have the capacity to do so much more than we're ever told and when you come back into integrity, what comes online is partly your magic. And I mean, you mentioned Esther Hicks. Talk about manifestation. The reason people can't manifest what they want when, when they're thinking about it is that they don't really want it. When you get back into integrity and you're asking for what your whole self truly wants, you don't even have to ask. It just comes. It's like yeah. bang, bang, bang. When you're out of integrity, it's like, where is it? I can't find it. Because we are all meant to live in peace. And God immediately sends everything we ask us ask God for, but it always gets sent to our real home address, which is peace. So when we get into integrity and we find that inner peace, it's like, wham, magic starts popping up all around. So I've had such a great response to the way of integrity. And I wanted to take people that extra step to teach them how to use the internal magic in a way that is absolutely concrete and it works and it's not, it's a little, 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 but not really. Oh it's, my God. It's there like, was like, 
when you come back to it, you're like, oh yeah, this, of course, of course this. There was 19 mic drops in that um, piece and that, that when you're in integrity, then it just comes and because it knows your address, which has to be peace, right? It just shows up at that. And you said it's because we're not usually trying to manifest what we really want. Yeah. So one of the things that I was looking at your course a little bit, you talk about imagining then what is your ideal mode of living or what is that? So how do we figure out, um, how do we find our way to what it is that we really do desire? How do we find that? Well, the whole thing about what makes you happy, what on your list of things to do makes you feel good, what people do you like or dislike, these are all ways of orienting. But if you want to cut straight to the chase, there are four things that I saw being used by every, and I, I went around the world and I talked to a lot of charlatans and people that did not rub me the right way. And then I found people who were really like bona fide magic. <laughs> and they were all doing four things in order. So one of them is imagination, but that's not the first thing. In order to get your imagination to work in a magical way, first you have to basically move into the right hemisphere of your brain. And that's a process that I call wordlessness because it's the nonverbal part of the brain. I'm good friends with Jill Bolte Taylor. She is a Harvard neuroanatomist who lost her left hemisphere to a stroke and then developed it back again. But talk about knowing how the magic works. She had no language for almost eight years, but she oh knew herself to be connected with everything. She could sense energy incredibly well. She I mean, keep it on the down low because she's a scientist, but she's a miracle. She's a walking miracle <laughs> and she makes miracles. And, but we have to be able to go into that state ourselves. And I teach techniques for doing that. And when you do that, then you, you find yourself in that oneness. So connecting, it's like you turn on the magic of your body, the way you turn on a computer. It's like you have a computer, but you've been using it as a placemat for all these yes. years. And someone says, turn it on wordlessness connect to the internet oneness then imagination becomes you literally building things in the in in non-material reality that can become real because your brain has that capacity and what you're meant to imagine comes to you through the wordlessness through the oneness so it's more a delivery system than you thinking stuff up and then that's like creating online and then you do forming, which is you create in real life the thing you've imagined. And that's the reason we're sitting here talking to each other on these fancy machines. And uh, because everybody's, everybody who uses imagination that way has to tap into that wordless oneness at some point. And this course is just a way to teach you to really like just do it and, and be able to work magic in your own life. Oh my God. How excited is everyone listening to that? You're just like, um, can we be in it right now? Um, so when does it, when does registration open? It opens in May, correct? Yeah, I think it's like really soon. I'm so sorry. I don't keep track of logistics. I'm no, like, she doesn't. Yes, I'm That's so okay. Sorry. We're going to send out links and we'll put it, okay, we'll put it everywhere. So everybody yeah, knows. Check on my website if you're interested, MarthaBeck.com. Oh, it's so good. Everything is so beautiful. And everyone is, <laughs> there's like every third comment, someone's like, that was the biggest mic drop. Oh my gosh, what she just said, quoting you. So let's take a few questions. Thank you so much. This is so generous. It was so powerful. It was fun. It was gorgeous. Tell everybody where they can follow you, buy the books, find out when the class is coming, all of the stuff. The only thing I can remember is my name. So Instagram, Twitter, website marthabeck.com yeah that combination of letters should take you places yes. <laughs> kathy thank you so much it was oh my god you're just love you're just love inside of a body and it's the best and um thank you and we're gonna spend some time now when you go we're just gonna talk about how awesome you are and maybe do a little journaling on this conversation thank you all so much and thank you kathy for creating this beautiful community what a lovely group of individuals. God bless. God bless. She's the best.